Typically, muscle power is assessed and measured with a vertical jump or a standing broad jump. So the ability of your athlete to do a, perform a standing broad jump as far as possible or a vertical jump as high as possible would provide a level and a measure of their leg power. To identify uh, upper body power, generally we do a seated medicine ball throw where a person is sitting in their chair and they use a, a medicine ball placed over their head and they throw the ball as far as possible in a forward direction and those with high levels of explosive power in the upper body would achieve a longer distance with the throw. This is an example of upper body power and how we would measure. The next type of fitness attribute is muscular endurance. So muscle endurance is the ability of your muscle or a group of muscles to perform a repetitive action until fatigue. So if I give the example of sit-ups, crunches, dips, squats, burpees, star jumps, and the plank, these would be examples of muscle endurance. Performing as many repetitions as possible until fatigue occurs. So these are particularly easy activities to perform on the field or in the gym to assess levels of muscle endurance. The final fitness quality is flexibility. Flexibility is the range of a joint, a muscle, or a group of muscles. So the ability of that joint to move through a range of motion. A muscle, such as the calf muscle, a soleus muscle, to move through a range of motion, or a group of muscles, like the hamstrings or the quadriceps, to move through a range of motion. Flexibility can be measured, once again, in the gymnasium, in the laboratory, in a number of different ways. It's always better to try and isolate a particular joint or muscle rather than testing a range of joints and a range of muscles. For instance, we can assess the flexibility of the ankle joint in different planes. We can assess in flexion, the forward movement, and dorsiflexion, the backward movement of the ankle. We can assess the ankle in terms of eversion, the outside movement, and inversion, the inside movement, and maybe the rotation of the ankle joint itself. So there are three types of flexibility assessments for the one joint. In terms of hamstring, Typically, a sit and reach test is performed where you sit with legs straight, heels against a wall, and you reach forward with your hands to try and touch the wall. Touching the wall would give you a zero level of flexibility. That is, with fingers touching the wall, you have a zero point of reference. If your fingers are unable to touch the wall, and we measure the distance from the tips of your fingers to the wall, we have a negative score, maybe a negative five centimetres. Those with very good flexibility are able to touch much farther past their toes. And this would give them a positive score. So a plus five or a plus 10 centimetres. Now in some sports and activities, it's an advantage having high levels of flexibility. In other sports and activities, it's a disadvantage to perhaps have a high level of flexibility around the shoulder joint 
or the knee joint, which would make it much more likely to dislocate or injure during your actual activity. I can imagine a wrestler would require low levels of flexibility around the joints so that the muscles don't dislocate. The jumpers need low levels of flexibility around the knee joint so that when they land, we have good stability on the landing. So when we look at flexibility, we have to look at each joint, muscle and group of muscles in isolation. This is important. So we've now gone through the seven attributes of fitness. We've discussed cardiovascular endurance, speed, agility, muscle strength, muscle power, muscle endurance, and flexibility. What you now need to do is determine and rank in order which of these qualities are most important for my sport or activity. I find as an exercise physiologist that it's very, very difficult to train all seven qualities for international athletes. We don't feasibly have the time to improve all seven physical attributes. In some sports, only some of these seven attributes are necessary for your sport and activity. In other sports, we might, might use a more complete range of these activities. What you need to do as an athlete, and you may need to consult your strength and conditioner and your coach, you need to decide which of these seven attributes is most important for your sport and activity. So that the majority of your strength and conditioning training focuses then on these attributes that are most necessary for your sport. We would say that if you're focusing on elements that are not necessary for your sport, then you're wasting your training time and that training time should instead be used to, to strengthen those physical attributes that are most important for your sport. As an example, if you're a sprinter, then I would think speed, power and flexibility are most important for a 100 metre sprinter. In comparison, agility and cardiovascular endurance, the ability to run for 15 or 20 minutes, is not nearly as important as speed, power and flexibility. So you may need to refocus some elements of your training just to ensure that you're focusing on the correct physical attributes and fitness qualities so that you can achieve important gains in your sport. I think it's an important process to sit and rank from one to seven, which you feel are the most important for your sport. When you're in self-isolation for the next two weeks, certainly have discussions with your strength and conditioning coach, your coach, other athletes, from similar sports and activities and discuss which do you think are the most important physical attributes that I need to train to ensure that I'm improving. My experience is that many athletes are spending too much time on the wrong physical attributes. They're wasting valuable time that they could be spending on the attributes that will actually make a difference in their sport. This is most important. The next area that we should discuss are the energy systems of the body. 
The, en the energy systems, I relate to the engine in your car. Some engines, a V8 engine, is much more stronger and more powerful than, say, a V4 engine. So those with V8 engines have a greater capacity to perform at speed, for instance, than those with a V4 engine. To use an example, many of the Kenyan and Ethiopian international athletes, the long distance runners, they have a particularly large engine. Genetically and part environmentally, they're gifted with very large engines. Whereas many of us don't have that luxury and we must improve our engines and the efficiency of our engine to even compete against these types of athletes. Our bodies generally have three different types of engines, unlike a motor car that only has one. We're particularly lucky we can apply these three engines to different circumstances. If we require an engine for long distance, we have such an engine. It's called the oxygen energy system. If we require an engine for very short but high intensity activities, we have such an engine. It's called the phosphocreatine engine or energy system. And then thirdly, we have an engine for activities between 10 seconds and 60 seconds that require high intensity efforts. This is called the glycolytic engine or energy system. So the body uses these three energy systems throughout our activities. While we're sitting at rest for most of the day, while we're performing slow up to moderate intensity activity, we generally use the oxygen energy system. This is the most predominant system in the body. This system uses a combination of oxygen and fat to provide fuel for the engine. The engines are our small mitochondria in each of the cells. Now generally, we always have a good supply of oxygen and many of us also have a good supply of fat. So providing fuel for this energy system is very easy. It's the most predominant energy system in the body. When we discuss cardiovascular endurance as a fitness attribute, and we discuss doing the VO2 max test to assess cardiovascular endurance, this test is assessing your ability to use the oxygen from the air to generate energy while we're exercising. It's called the VO2, the volume of oxygen being utilized. This system is called an aerobic energy system with aerobic meaning using oxygen as your fuel. The oxygen breaks down fat into fatty acids and we use those fatty acids then as a fuel supply. Where do we get our fats from? Within the body, most of us have large amounts of stored fat. These fat stores are converted into fatty acids as we require and are used while we're performing resting, low intensity, up to moderate intensity exercises. If we suddenly perform an activity for only a short duration, but requires maximum intensity, perhaps a 30 meter sprint, punching a wall for 10 seconds, jumping up and down on the spot for five seconds, this requires a different type of fuel and different energy system. This time, the fuel is supplied by creatine, which is stored in the muscle itself. Unfortunately, 
the muscles have a very short supply of this fuel. As we approach 10 seconds of high intensity exercise, the muscle starts to deplete in this type of fuel. So it's no longer possible to sustain our performance for longer than 10 seconds using this phosphocreatine energy system. The creatine itself, we generally consume through protein type foods. In red meats in particular, provide creatine, which is stored in the muscle, and then it is used during our high intensity, maximum explosive efforts for less than 10 seconds. This might occur in the gym when you're performing perhaps three to five repetition lifts of a bench press or a squat. So creatine is often used as a supplement by people who are trying to improve their strength levels. Creatine itself doesn't actually improve your strength, but it gives the body the opportunity to perform at a high level of exertion, so lift at a high level of exertion, for up to 10 seconds. The benefit of this energy system is, if we rest completely after our 10 seconds, and we rest completely for 30 seconds, then all of the creatine effectively fills up the muscle again, and we're ready for another high intensity effort for the next 10 seconds. So to repeat that, if you perform a high intensity effort for up to 10 seconds, then rest for the next 30 seconds, so resting completely, the creatine fuel supplies completely refill to allow you to perform another high intensity effort. If, however, you're not recovering for the full 30 seconds, this doesn't allow the creatine supply to completely refill. So your next intense effort won't be as complete. Fatigue much faster because you're literally running out of creatine fuel. The third energy system, called the glycolytic energy system, is typically used when you're performing high intensity efforts between 10 seconds and one minute. So imagine sprinting for 400 meters as hard as you possibly can. This uses the glycolytic energy system. Glycolytic meaning the energy this time is coming from glucose or glycogen that's stored within the body and the muscles are using this fuel during the exercise. Typically the glucose comes from carbohydrates that we eat and the glucose is stored in the liver and then stored in the muscle as glycogen. Your brain takes from the liver and uses the glucose from the liver as a fuel source. Your exercising muscles use the, gluco the glycogen that's stored within those working muscles to provide fuel for your exercise. One of the problems with using this energy system are the waste products that are generated. As you break down the glycogen into a fuel source that can be used by the body, hydrogen atoms are produced and they make the muscle very acidic. So the more hydrogen atoms that are produced, the more acidic the muscle becomes. And it's this acidity this heavy-legged feeling, this lactic acid feeling, that generally then reduces your performance. So imagine at the end of the 400 meter sprint around the oval, how heavy your legs feel. This is as a result 
of the breaking down of the glycogen to use as a fuel and the waste products are causing a problem. So now, we discussed ranking each of the fitness attributes that are important for your sport. It's also important to go through the process of ranking which is the most important energy system or energy systems for your particular sport. The phosphocreatine energy system and the glycolytic energy system are called anaerobic energy systems. This means they're not utilizing oxygen as an energy source. So we have two anaerobic and one aerobic energy systems. You need to sit and discuss perhaps with your coach and your strength and conditioner which of these energy systems is the most important for my particular sport or activity? Because in your training program, these are the areas you need to focus most on. So if 400 meter sprinting is not part of your general activity, because you're most likely to be performing high intensity efforts for less than 10 seconds, then this is the type of training you most need to focus on. As a strength and conditioning person and an exercise physiologist, once again, I see lots of athletes spending many, many hours training, both on the track, in the gym, on the pitch. But often, they're doing training that's improving the energy system that's not actually being utilized in their particular sport. Once again, they're wasting some time when this time should be more effectively used to train the energy systems that are more important for their particular activity. If you're having difficulty understanding these concepts or you wish to have some more discussion then please send questions and I'll be quite happy to reply to your questions. It may be that you're asking your coaches or your conditioners to ask these questions for you on your behalf. But it's very important while we have this time together that you're able to identify which fitness attributes and which energy systems are the most important for you and your sport. We need to take some positives out of this time that we have in a lockdown period. And I think each day it, we should plan perhaps in four different areas. The first area would be physical. So have a plan to improve or maintain your physical level of fitness. In a confined area, it is still relatively easy to maintain or perhaps even improve your core fitness, your flexibility and your muscle endurance. To improve in these three areas, we don't need a lot of equipment or a lot of space. You just need the motivation and the type of exercises you need to perform to improve these three areas. It's important to note that within three weeks, there will be some detraining effect. So if you are not performing your normal high level of intensity, you're not able to access the gym, you're not able to get onto the field and perform as you normally would in training, it's normal and natural. There'll be some detraining effect that you will lose some level of fitness. However, in three weeks, only around 30 to 40% of your cardiovascular endurance will decrease. And this 30 to 40% will improve very quickly and dramatically once we resume our normal life. 
but you should be able to maintain your core strength, muscle endurance, and maybe improve in these areas over the next three weeks because you can now dedicate the time specifically in these areas. So firstly, plan for your physical. Secondly, plan for your nutritional. If you're doing significantly less physical activity than you were previously, it may be important to look at your calorie intake per day. You may have to reduce your calorie intake per day. However, please make sure that the intake of the nutrients is balanced, that you're still having the required level of proteins, good fats and carbohydrates per day in your meals. It's particularly important that we don't have long fasting periods. In your normal activity and normal lifestyle, you would perhaps be eating two, three, four, five times a day, three meals, two snacks. Perhaps you feel that that's not possible now. It's important that you still eat regularly, although the amounts might be smaller, to maintain your metabolism. Your metabolism is the amount of energy that your body produces each day. If the body senses that you're eating less or less often, your metabolism will start to slow down. And this is not good in the long term. So please ensure that perhaps you may have to reduce your calorie intake, but don't reduce the number of times you're eating during the day. The third area that you should plan is mental. As athletes, you're conditioned to do goal setting, whether it's on a daily basis or a weekly basis or a monthly basis. Please don't change this behavior. Set yourself small goals for every day, whether they be physical goals, nutritional goals, perhaps it may be to improve in areas that you've neglected in the past, simply because you haven't had the training time. Learn something new each day. Set a goal to learn something new each day that's going to improve you as a person and an athlete. Hopefully some of today's information will be new to you and you've achieved today's goal. And the fourth area that I think you should plan is your emotional well-being. So with emotion, we now have endless amounts of time. So it would be a good time for you to reach out to family, current friends, old friends, other athletes, coaches, through social media and the telephone, and make a connection with these people. As athletes, we become very isolated in ourselves and our own environment when we're training. Use this next two to three weeks as a time to reach out to other people and make connections again with them. So these are four areas that I think you should plan, have a plan for in each day. Your physical area, your nutritional area, your mental area, and your emotional area. I hope these are able to assist you to get through the next two weeks and the information is valuable for both now in the short term and perhaps the long term future for you. Please have patience, maintain your health and continuing and continue to self-isolate and over the next two weeks to ensure that as athletes and the athletic population of India, we can return very quickly to a normal lifestyle. If there are any questions, please can you forward them to me and I'll try and go through some of these questions now um, and answer them for you.
I have a question from Binoy Hazar. And he's asking, can you please some, some, suggest some exercises for a young age group, 10 to 15 years? So a sub-junior sub age group. So Binoy, uh, during the, this age between 10 to 15, often the athletes are going through a growth spurt. This is called the adolescent growth spurt. When the limbs grow quite quickly, but the muscles are left behind. And this is the perfect time to be introducing core exercises and most importantly, flexibility exercises. If these athletes who are progressing through their adolescent growth spurt can improve their flexibility during this time, they become at less risk to a number of injuries that might occur as a result of quick growth. Sever's disease, for instance, Oshgood Slatter's disease, these are injuries that occur purely because of adolescent growth spurt. And this is a perfect time in the next two weeks to be teaching your young 10 to 15 year olds the correct type of flexibility exercises to be doing. Because the education they receive in the next two weeks will be helpful not just for now, but for the rest of their sporting lives. Another question from Poonam Joshi. Sir, do we need to take a break during our normal training week? Poonam, yes. Recovery is a very important aspect of an athlete's life. So recovery from particularly the high intensity exercises or the long duration exercise, it is important that the following training session is a recovery session. Many coaches and strength and conditioning personnel label their training sessions as either green, yellow, or red, where green sessions are low intensity or recovery sessions, yellow sessions are moderate intensity, and red sessions are high intensity sessions. And as a general rule, you, you always follow a red session with a green session. So if you're having two to three red sessions in a training week, they're always followed with green recovery sessions. Now recovery can take many different aspects. It can be just rest from the activity itself. But most important, we would include massage, hydrotherapy, yoga, cryotherapy as forms of recovery following high intensity exercise sessions. So yes, it is important to take rest during your training week and that we're not training heavily every single day. The muscles themselves require replenishment from nutri nutrients and the mind needs rest from the intense exercise. A question from Siddharth. Should we be maintaining our cardiovascular endurance during the lockdown? Siddharth, yes. If it's possible, we need to do two to three sessions of a minimum 20 minutes cardiovascular endurance to maintain your fitness level. Now, it may not be possible in some circumstances to achieve this. So perhaps we need to then resort to muscular endurance type exercises. Squats, push-ups, dips. And we perform these exercises in a rotation, in a sequence, that perhaps lasts up to 20 minutes. If the heart and the lungs and the blood are pumping over this time for 20 minutes, it's a valuable exercise for our cardiovascular system. For those that aren't able to participate in cardiovascular endurance, then there will be a decrease in your fitness level, your cardiovascular level over the next two to three weeks. As I said, you'll detrain by up to 30 to 
However, don't stress because perhaps this is a good time for your body to need a rest leading into a heavy training session that will occur following the lockdown. Or once you can achieve your normal training regime again, then your cardiovascular will improve very quickly over the next two to three weeks. We have a cricket question asking what type of exercises should be used in the gymnasium for fast bowlers. So if we look at the type of fitness qualities that a fast bowler requires, at a high level fast bowlers are running around 8 to 10 kilometers over a day. But the action of fast bowling requires power and flexibility. So in relation to your question, in the gym, please make sure that the exercises that are being performed are power type exercises. These exercises are generally 10 to 15 repetitions with a light to moderate weight where the exercise is performed at the normal working speed, the normal exercise speed that you're likely to experience on the field, on the pitch. If you perform the exercise too slowly, then it's more difficult to transfer the achievements that you're from the gym to the bowling pitch. So please make sure that the weight is not too heavy and that the exercises are done at speed. This is most important for power training. Mahi Lahiri has asked, what should be the minimum time one should spend on exercise daily? To answer this question, generally, if we exercise for a minimum of 20 minutes continuously, there will be some improvement in your fitness attributes. Whether this is cardiovascular type training, muscular endurance type training, even flexibility type training, there will be some improvement in these attributes. So a minimum of 20 minutes is the answer to the question. Rather than try and answer all of the questions that I'm receiving at the moment, I'll be quite happy to answer individually over the next week, as I also am in lockdown, and it'll give me something to do for the next two weeks or so. So please continue to send your questions, and I'll attempt to answer as, most, as quickly as I possibly can. I hope today's information was informative to you all, that you achieved your goal of learning something new and you're able to continue in your own small environment to achieve goals in fitness, nutrition, mental and emotion over the next 14 or so days. Thank you all for your listening and thank you to the support of Sports Authority of India and Ministry of Youth Affairs for allowing us to provide this information to you. Thank you.